Hey guys, welcome back to Task and Purpose. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Since 2014, Poland has been forced to make some very creative changes to their military strategy. After the annexation of Crimea shocked their population, they welcomed over 3.4 million Ukrainian refugees who have fled their country since the start of the war. That represents about 60% of the total number of people who have fled the country since the Russian invasion began. Poland has stood up to Russian aggression by sending $1.6 billion worth of weapons, including over 200 tanks, overtly into Ukraine. They've also allowed their 500-kilometer border to be used to openly transfer NATO aid packages into their neighboring country. These decisions have put them directly in the crosshairs of Russia. In this video, we're going to make a ground-level average infantryman's analysis of Poland's military, their weapons, war fighting strategy, and the key reasons for their enormous geopolitical influence in the region. 80% of Polish people now say that they're worried about a future military conflict with Russia. That might sound ridiculous to you, but on Friday, May 13th, a Russian lawmaker named Oleg Morozov warned Poland that they were, quote, put in the first place in the queue for denazification after Ukraine. Russia's out here seeing Nazis in their Cheerios every dang morning. Now clearly, this is just some low-level Russian statesman making an absurd claim, right? So here's my thinking. If Poland had been invaded before 2014, if Russia had used their element of surprise to go straight through Crimea, through Ukraine, then yeah, they could have taken over Poland as well. And here's my evidence for that. In 2020, Poland held their biggest post-Cold War era war game, and the results were leaked to the press. It showed that they would lose a majority of their ground forces against the Russian military within five days. All right, so I can't wrap my head around how all the war games in 2020 ended with Russia wiping the floor with NATO. I can't help but be suspicious and think that they purposely rigged these games in order to lose so that they could justify more spending because Russia clearly was not capable of devastating Polish military forces like that. It's either that or our military officers and generals have really bad intelligence assets and they truly believe that the Russian military was that powerful. Polish officials then used the public sentiment to push for more military spending because obviously they were worried that they were gonna get destroyed by Russia. Now I know what you're thinking. Did he just bring up some evidence to support his own argument and then discredit it? Yes, I did. If you want someone's smarty pants, go watch Johnny Harris. Don't get me wrong, I think it's a good thing that they're increasing spending. Do what you gotta do, Poland. Poland, as you know, is a NATO country, so if Russia even accidentally attacks their forces, it's the most likely scenario for a war growing larger in Europe. Russia might not have the ability to take on Poland, but what if their allies China were to join the fight? How would Poland's military stand up against an outside invasion? That war game didn't take into account how effective the changes since 2014 have been. So let's take a look at what some of those are. To set the stage for Poland is something you really need to understand. They drew the short straw when it came to geographic placement. Their entire history, they've been flanked by aggressive countries trying to invade and take them over, like the German and Russian military. For this reason, Poland was only independent for 20 out of 200 years between the 18th and 20th centuries. As an American soldier, it's really impossible for me to imagine what it's like to constantly have the threat of a foreign military invading your country. They have a population of 37 million people, and the country's landmass is about the same size as the state of New Mexico, so the Polish military has been through a few decades of downsizing and underfunding. So now they're scrambling to reverse this trend. We can see in this breakdown of Poland's defense spending that it peaked in 1977 at about $17 billion. Then there was some economic problems here, and their spending increased back up to 11 billion by 2019. The problem traces its roots back to when they first left the Soviet Union. At that point, they finally got their independence. They were an extremely poor nation, and all of the signs pointed to Poland possibly becoming a failed state. Everyone was surprised when they became a beacon of success and one of the strongest economies in all of Europe. The three major industries in the country are agriculture, manufacturing of cars, and mining of things like coal. In fact, they've been on an economic winning streak now with 26 years of straight growth. The reason for this success since they left the Soviet Union was in part due to the strict reforms that they imposed. For instance, Polish officials immediately announced a major reorganization of their armed forces in January 1989. 
These initial changes were an absolute shock to the system. Parliament threatened to cut off defense funds if the military didn't provide an exhaustive, detailed outline of how all the tax money was being spent. Wait a second, oversight and rules? What kind of nonsense is this? How am I supposed to grease my corrupt wheels and my corrupt pockets? Like this, democracy is the worst. This kind of accountability never existed before. Previously, under Soviet rule, the parliament was kind of just there as a formality to rubber stamp and approve everything that the military wanted to do. So the military was essentially given a budget of survival and ordered to reduce itself. The government was given more oversight of the Ministry of Defense. On February 26, 1990, a new Polish military doctrine was published that would supersede the old Warsaw Pact doctrine. In the new positioning, the army was handed a strictly defensive role. All of the military units that had an offensive mission, like the airborne and amphibious assault divisions, they were cut. This trend of military downsizing continued from 1989 when they had 350,000 soldiers in Poland to 2011 when they had cut all the way back to one third the size. In 2008, Poland disbanded their entire territorial defense forces, which is a paramilitary defense group, and they're going to play a major role you'll see later on. The next year in 2009, Poland ended mandatory conscription of, or drafts in their country so they no longer force civilians into becoming soldiers. You know, I made some comments about the Finland conscripts in my last video, and I wanna clarify that, because I've since learned from all of you in the comments section. A lot of you viewers held me accountable to my mistakes, and that's why I love you. Apparently, conscripts in Finland are known for being very well trained, specifically. Not all conscripts are created equal. I got that part wrong in the last video. It's not the same situation as conscripts who are forced to fight in a war of aggression or conscripts who only have four months of training, like some of the forces in Taiwan. The reason Poland plays such a massive role in Europe's geopolitics is partly because of their geography. It's very unique. Their landmass has no real natural barriers or anything that would prevent you from just walking right into Russia. There are no big mountain ranges or water features there. Just wide open land. And that's what makes it so valuable and why Russia and any other country looking to control more land in Europe needs Poland. Mackender's Heartland Theory was written by the founder of geopolitics in the early 1900s, and it, he said whoever rules the heartland of Eastern Europe would rule the world. Poland is located in this pivot area, the core of Eurasia. Right now I don't sound like the average infantryman anymore, I sound like the pretentious one. I looked at an old famous Soviet era war plan that had been declassified by Polish defense minister Radoslaw Sarowski when they published their Warsaw documents in 2005 and it outlines Russia's plan for attacking NATO if they were hit first. The Soviet-era military plan for Poland sounds really kind of weirdly familiar. The Russians saw Poland as a giant staging ground to safely transport and mass concentrations of troops. The reason I found this to be weird is because that's exactly how NATO now utilizes Poland, but they're staging troops in the opposite direction. In a paper published by Colonel Marcial Frock for the Polish National Security Bureau, he outlines exactly this. He points out that an essential component of Polish security policy is to consolidate NATO members around collective defense, since they're so centrically located. That's why they're trying to build new bases for NATO. So basically he's saying by having a continuous rotation of soldiers in Poland, it acts as a deterrence for all of Eastern Europe. Having Poland on your side gives you a massive advantage because it's like having access to the door between the East and the West. Poland got a rude awakening in 2014 when Russia annexed Crimea. Poland was shocked by how quickly irregular special forces Russian soldiers were able to sabotage and essentially stroll right in and take over parts of Ukraine. Big army units are not designed to be everywhere at once and prevent something like that from happening. Poland had gotten rid of these units that were trained specifically in anti-sabotage missions, so they instantly made a really smart move that I'm kind of impressed by, because usually governments are very slow to get anything done. 
Poland quickly reversed their decision and got their territorial defense forces back and gave them an incredibly important job. By 2016, Poland had added 24,000 territorial defense forces with a plan to add another 30,000 over the next four years. Territorial defense forces aren't exactly like the reserves. Once Polish reserve soldiers are called up, they're instantly integrated into active duty units. Territorial defense forces operate autonomously, under their own command. The whole idea is that these soldiers that are part of this, they're locals from the populations that are nearby. So they're the ones that they know the area they live in. These soldiers know when something is out of place in their hometown, when someone is somewhere that they're not supposed to be, they're gonna be the first ones to notice that. Huh, what's that? Russian soldiers are usually never here. Hey, get out of here, Russian soldiers, scram. This is a very unique defense strategy, and it's similar to the Ukrainian military's defensive organization and operations. But leave it up to Politico to write this ridiculous article about how these forces are gonna potentially be used by the right-wing arm of the Polish government against their own citizens as their own instrument to enact control over the people. It's an absolutely absurd thought cooked up in the mind of someone who's extremely creative. Listen, if they had had something like this in Ukraine in 2014, maybe all of this could have been avoided. Their motto is always ready, always close, and it perfectly encapsulates their mission. Their funding is relatively small, 60 million euros per year. They were initially created into three brigades of light infantry that would be positioned specifically in the northeastern part of the country. They are the initial defense that would prevent an enemy country from setting up a foothold in Poland. Similar to how the United States is divided into 50 different states, Poland is divided into 16 Voivod ships, and each Voivod ship will eventually have its own territorial defense brigade. It's their job to prevent sabotage and safeguard reception and allied forces command areas, and now they're tasked with helping refugees. There are several reasons why I think Poland began seriously investing in their modernization of their military, and it actually started a few years ago. In 2020, the dictator of Belarus asked for Russian military support from Putin in order to stop nationwide protests that were disputing his fraudulent election results. He basically made a deal with the devil because after that, Russia has used Belarus to threaten Poland. By 2021, Poland's relation with their neighbors, Belarus, had deteriorated badly. The dictator of Belarus created a refugee crisis on Poland's border. Some believe this was organized and directed by Moscow. What happened was Poland had sanctioned the Belarus dictator, Lukashenko, for political oppression of his people. He was throwing journalists in jail who were critical of him. In response to these sanctions, Belarus coordinated transportation of tens of thousands of refugees from Iraq to the border with Poland and just set them free there, pointing them in the direction of Poland. Belarusian forces destroyed Polish border barriers, harassed Polish security forces, and they even were claimed to have fired blank rounds at them. This is what we would call a form of hybrid warfare that we keep hearing about. We live in a day and age where direct confrontation between major nuclear-backed powers is off the table, at least for now. Poland says these attacks are Belarus weaponizing and exploiting the problems of migrants against them. The rising tension between Poland, Belarus, and Russia led to an increase in military spending in 2021. Poland's military modernization plan goes way beyond this. They will also plan to double their active duty forces to between 250 and 300,000 enlisted and officers. Poland has 114,000 military personnel. Their army makes up 61,000 of those soldiers, and they operate 800 main battle tanks, 5,000 IFEs, but only 119 of those are modern Leopard main battle tanks. 313 of the infantry fighting vehicles are the modern Rosamark, with the rest being the old Soviet BTRs and BMPs. The Polish military has one weird quirk that you can't get away from, and that's that they have a strange mix of Soviet-era equipment. Other former Soviet countries that are smaller were able to do away with the influence of old Russia military equipment, but because of Poland's relative size, they're, they're larger, this means that the surplus of Soviet equipment is harder to get rid of on the cheap. For this reason, the Polish military has several tiers of units, ranging from updated high-tech Western equipment, all the way down to old, outdated, awful Soviet-era vehicles. Poland had to use 382 of the old, outdated Soviet 1980s-era T-72 main battle tanks. 
but they're actually ended up donating almost all of them to Ukraine once Russia invaded. One of the most notable strategic moves by the Polish military was their repositioning of their combat forces. In 2017, they shifted their best armored units to the east, sending their two battalions of Leopard 2A5 tanks from the 34th Armored Cavalry Brigade to the Polish border with Kaliningrad. They were relocated to the Swalski Gap that connects Poland to Lithuania. Since Poland joined the EU in 2004, there have been some ways that has helped to benefit their country. In the last decade, the EU invested 40 billion euros into the Polish infrastructure because they saw how valuable this country is. It included creating state-of-the-art highways and completely renovating their rundown train stations in some cases. This money also helped set up a broadband network, really modernizing the country along with its military. However, Poland's air defense forces were under-equipped in the past, but they are now ordering two batteries of Patriot missile systems and several other modern anti-air systems like 77 of the SPZP Poprads. According to the paper Protecting the Flank, starting in 2014, the Polish military began focusing on combined operations warfare by creating a new command and control structure. This reform established the operational command of the armed forces and it created the general staff of the Polish Armed Forces. So unfortunately, the 250 M1 Abrams main battle tanks that Poland ordered last year from America won't be delivered until 2025. This is part of the $4.5 billion tank modernization plan for them. The other major section of Polish ground forces are their mechanized infantry fighting vehicles. These vehicles are far better than the Russian or American counterparts. Because Poland would be fighting a defensive war, these vehicles would be a great way to supplement their relatively small number of main battle tanks that they have. The reason for this is because these vehicles can be upgraded with a new turret to fire spike anti-tank missiles. The major setback for this vehicle is that only a small number have been outfitted with any of these anti-tank missile systems, which makes me think that the Polish government doesn't fully understand the value of those anti-tank missile systems because they'll be sitting ducks without those. The second string backup armored vehicles for the infantry are borderline non-usable in Poland. We're talking about ancient BMP-1s that might be more of a liability on the modern battlefield than an asset. They operate about 1,500 of these old vehicles, some of which have already been donated to Ukraine. And it's the whole reason why Poland decided to create their own replacement for the BMP-1 called the Amphibious Borisok IFV, which is incredibly strange that Poland has decided to go ahead and create their own IFV when there's so many off-the-shelf solutions that they could choose from. Wait, actually, it looks like it's based on the K9 South Korean chassis. Dang, look how big that thing is compared to the main battle tank. That's a big, beautiful beast. The Polish infantry main battle rifle, the MSBS Grot 556 firing, it's the first weapon completely made by Poland since World War II, and it's seen lots of combat in Ukraine against Russia. It's similar to the HK416, but it's said to actually be even better. When it comes to Poland's artillery power, they started ordering modern artillery vehicles like the 155mm Crab, which they currently only have about 50 produced, but they do plan on creating an additional 78 more. There are some potential problems with this though, and it might have to do with the government not fully understanding where the values of these artillery system really lies. Supposedly, they do not have any special ammunition developed for the crab artillery, so they have no GPS-guided munitions. The biggest advantage of creating new artillery units is the modern-day munitions. Otherwise, you're not taking advantage of those platforms. The other weird quirk is the way that they salute. They're the only military force in the entire world confident enough to rock the two-finger salute. No joke, one finger represents honor and the other represents the fatherland. Unlike some of the smaller NATO countries, Poland has an air force. They have 48 F-16 fighter jets, which is better than none, but it's not enough to really protect their skies. In 2020, Poland signed an agreement to buy 32 of the next generation F-35 fighter jets from the United States. The second string air units are the 30 MiG-29 Soviet air fighter jets. It's clear that having Poland as an ally is incredibly important to any military alliance that wants to influence both Western Europe and Eastern Europe. Their reforms are definitely helping with Poland's military now being ranked 24 out of 142 countries by global firepower. 
I think because of Poland's 50,000 strong territorial defense force, they have a strong fighting chance against any invasion because they would be able to hold off any enemy with shoulder fired missiles until NATO was able to arrive in full force and that is key to Poland's defensive strategy. They are the go-between, the transitory doorway through which military forces need to be staged. After decades of hoping they wouldn't need to invest heavily in their military, Poland has realized they no longer have that luxury. But what do you think of Poland's military? I want to hear in the comments section. At the end of the videos, when I say I'm interested in your comments, I really am. If you guys have good information on the Polish military, I'd love to hear it, especially if it's something that's correcting what I have to say. To me, that's the best part about making these videos, is I get to crowdsource this information from thousands of people who have tons of knowledge on these specific topics. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy. Thank you for watching Task and Purpose.